Uh, my name is George Harris. I'm curator and artistic director here at Two Rivers Gallery. I, uh, I would like to thank you all for coming here this evening and uh, to welcome you uh, to this celebration of our new exhibition uh, featuring The Tree Planters, a body of work by Rita Leisner. Uh, well, and remarkably, this is the first exhibition on artist talk that we've had in these spaces for well over two years, so uh, give yourselves a round of applause for coming back and, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I, I want to start by acknowledging that we are here today on the traditional unceded territory of the Clayton Tanay, and it's my great privilege to introduce to you Elder Darlene McIntosh from the Clayton Tanay, who is going to say a few words of welcome. Darlene. Hadi. 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 That's better. <laughs> You guys are too quiet. <laughs> I know you're all excited. Look at this beautiful photography. This, this lady looks like she's standing right here with us. Like, I'm just absolutely amazed at what you guys are going to be presented with tonight. It's beautiful. Well, I'm upstairs beating. So, it is after supper and uh, probably most of us have had a full day work or doing something. And so some of you may be tired, and, uh, but still coming out to this beautiful event. So what I want you to do just for this moment in time is I want you to close your eyes just for this moment. And I want you to take a nice deep cleansing breath throughout your whole body. Nice deep cleansing breath. We take that breath through our nose and then we have a long, drawn out exhale through our mouth until there's no breath. And we do this a couple of times. And you find yourself settling into your chair, allowing your chair to support you totally. As we breathe into our body, we come back to the essence of who we are. <clears throat> To the, to the true nature of our being, rather than our environment dictating how we should be. And remembering the day you were born, you took your first breath. And do we acknowledge that? Do we, are we in gratitude about it? We never stop breathing for 70, 80, 90 years. But the, the time that I put my, my hand over your mouth and your nose, you'd be grabbing it off and you would be thankful and you'd be in gratitude for what your breath does for you. And not only does it give you life, it also calms your nervous system down. So just imagine yourself out early in the morning. You're standing in the east direction you see the sun come up, and you take that nice deep breath. You acknowledge that when the sun comes up every day in the east direction, it gives you a new day, a new beginning, and new possibilities. And this we are grateful for. When we look around, we feel the wind on our face like feathers caressing us. And we pull that breath all the way down into our feet. And we feel our feet sink into the deep, rich soil of Mother Earth. We can smell the richness of her soil. We can feel it between our toes. And there she grounds you into the day, into this very moment, to what will be taking place tonight. So we have all of our focus on what will happen. And we create that sacred space, all of us together. We create that sacred space for all of us to become one. We call on the Creator, the grandfathers and the grandmothers, and all of our ancestors to come be with us tonight. Surround us with the energies of our ancestors. Let us hear you in the songs of healing and the dance of strength 
Let the fires burn, drawing in creativity and all the unique forms that create the energies of what you will hear tonight. Let us wrap the beautiful colors around us, bringing the energies that will refresh our spirit. Creator, hear our prayers. As we view the world of tree planters that help our environment survive climate change, imagine planting 45 million trees on 26,000 hectares of land. Scientists have described the forest as the lungs of the earth, as the trees transform carbon dioxide into oxygen. How much more intimate can we get with Mother Earth? The trees breathe out, we breathe in. We breathe out, the trees breathe in. How powerful is that? Creator, hear our prayers. Creator, thank you for this beautiful night on Mother Earth. Thank you for the gift of community. Thank you for bringing all who are present, ready and willing to work towards building a strong relationship with our environment and the people who consciously are aware of what is taking place through climate change. We are now willing to make a powerful commitment to self and those around us. May we express healing through our beautiful forests, feeling the vibration of all the people that have passed through the doors of enlightenment. Creator, hear our prayers. Mother Earth, as we stand on you softly, connecting with your heartbeat, thank you for continuing to support us, allowing your essence to vibrate through us, interconnecting with all that lives in and on your body. Creator, great spirit, hear our prayers. May all those present journey in healing, light, and unconditional love. May your choices be freely, and with each step, growing in spirit. Know that Creator walks with you, feeling and experiencing life through you. May you walk softly on Mother Earth, leaving no footprints. Creator, hear our prayers. Creator, hear our prayers. We, the Clayton Tene Nation, have been on our traditional lands over 9,000 years as supported by lithic evidence. The changes have taken place over thousands of years supports the enduring strength, courage, and fortitude of our peoples. Our governance of the bat lots brought balance and harmony with our brothers and sisters of the other First Nations people. Clayton Tene's clans are Frog, Silyu, Grouse, Utsu, Beaver, Sa, and Bear Sus. Through this system, we know who our family connections are. Through our oral history, the use of legends told of our travels, our hunting and fishing territories, our trading practices with all peoples. May we remember and hold steadfast in what Creator's blessed us with, and that is our traditional territories. Our ancestors have always welcomed people to our territories. On behalf of Clayton Tanese elders, our youth, community members, and chief and council. It is absolutely our honor to welcome each and every one of you to our traditional territories. All my relations, must see. thank you. Natalia, thank you very much. Thank you, darling. Well, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that film, Love, actually, but uh, there's a scene there where uh, they're describing an octopus and somebody says, eight is a lot of arms. And uh, I feel like I have to say, two is a lot of years. <laughs> and over that time, uh, of course, there have been lots of changes here at uh, Two Rivers Gallery and, uh, uh, and new faces. And, uh, and I wanted to introduce to you uh, one of the, well, not so new faces now, uh, and I promise this is probably the last time I will ever say this this way, <clears throat> uh, but I would like to introduce you to our executive director, uh, Sarah Miller. So.
everyone. It is truly such a joy. Uh, though I no longer describe myself as new here, uh, it has been a long time since we've been able to welcome the full community in for a public opening to celebrate art together. And it is, it is truly a delight to see everyone here today. Thank you for being part of this event and for being here to celebrate uh, Rita Leisner and this extraordinary exhibition, The Tree Planters. Um, it is uh, part of my job, really, to um, ensure also that we take a moment before we get to the main event to thank all of the organizations and individuals who have made this exhibition possible. Um, and indeed, as I'm sure you know, it takes a lot, uh, it takes a lot to, build, uh, to build a show uh, such as this. Um, I want to thank uh, our key uh, core funders, the Regional District of Fraser Fort George, the Province of British Columbia, the BC Arts Council, the Canada Council for the Arts, uh, and the City of Prince George. Um, I also want to thank uh, the lenders to this exhibition. Uh, in particular, uh, I want to uh, give a special shout out to the National Gallery of Canada, who has been so good as to let us borrow these two extraordinary large-scale works. Uh, here in this gallery, uh, and also to the TD Art Collection uh, for lending the work to the show. Um, I would like to thank uh, Stephen Bulger at Stephen Bulger Gallery, who is, uh, uh, represents Rita Leisner uh, commercially, um, and who's really been a huge supporter of the show from idea to execution uh, over many years. Um, and also to thank Dowie Lewis, uh, the publisher of Forest for the Trees, the really beautiful book uh, that Rita has made uh, as a part of this project. We are very grateful to have uh, some copies of the book available in our shop that Rita has generously signed, and I'm sure she's happy to add inscriptions uh, to anyone who might uh, desire that later in the evening. Um, you may have noticed as you walked back here uh, this uh, structure in the other gallery. I feel uh, quite safe in saying that this is the first trailer slash enchanted forest uh, that's ever been built. Um, and this was also uh, uh, quite, a, quite a feat uh, to construct. Um, and I wanted to thank ATCO and particularly a gentleman by the name of Kevin Bowman uh, who supplied us with uh, uh, lots of the cladding and material uh, to be able to build this. And I want to especially thank Karen Anderson, uh, uh, the facility supervisor here at Two Rivers, uh, who is very sad not to be able to be with us tonight. Uh, but Karen really listened to us uh, talk about a crazy idea uh, and uh, told us that she could make it a reality. Um, and uh, a special thank you also to Don on the Lanson for uh, generously helping us in the construction of this uh, amazing room, which I invite everyone to experience if you have not yet. Um, uh, and of course, uh, I want to thank, um, I want to especially thank George Harris, uh, our wonderful curator and artistic director, who has guided this project I think over almost five years is the first time I understand. No, well, we said four, three years and nine months ago, I showed up here with, well, the duct tape prints that yes. you see. Yes, yes, exactly. I duct taped into the uh, Bush Camp exhibition, showed up here and met George, and actually Annie Kidd was here with me as well, so yeah. You've been on this whole journey as well, well Annie. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I want to thank the whole staff at Two Rivers. Really, every single member of our team here has been part of building the show and this event tonight. So thanks to, uh, to everyone for all of their hard work. Um, and, um, and finally, of course, I want to thank the tree planters. Um, are there any tree planters with us here tonight? Not necessarily in this exhibition, but people who planted a tree in their in their life. Okay. I, I, I really want to thank tree planters, you know? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for being an inspiration for the show, and really thank you more importantly for the really incredible work um, that you do for the land and for the planet. Uh, 
Just about two years ago, just about two years ago now, uh, almost two years ago now, uh, I, uh, I got an email uh, from Rita a couple of days after I formally accepted this job. It was uh, deep COVID 2020, and I was in the midst of trying to figure out how to move across the country uh, with uh, my husband and a three-year-old at the time. And um, Rita had heard uh, that I had taken this position and, um, and wrote me this email. Uh, <laughs> well, well, from her older brother, who I've known since <laughs> 2004 was yeah. the walrus story. Exactly. And I've known Sarah since about 2005 and, yeah. you know, connected over art for years and across the world, really. Exactly. Yeah. As Sarah was doing her PhD in curatorial in London and, you know, of course, always dreamed that one day we would do a show together. But, you know, COVID and... You're busy with the child. We hadn't spoken for a long time. And when Josh, I was like, well, what's Sarah doing? Oh, haven't you heard? She's moving to Prince George to work for the Two Rivers Gallery. I'm like, oh my God, she hasn't made the connection yet between tree planting and Prince George. And I already knew she was coming to work with George Harris, who I'd been in, converse, I'd been in conversation with for nearly two years by then. So it's pretty stunning that we're having our first experience collaborating on the tree planner show, here. it's a it's really, amazing. it's a really special, it's a really special thing for me. And I, um, Rita told me earlier today that she was going to talk about bridges a little bit in her talk, and so I wanted to thank her for really being a bridge for me. Um, and uh, and I know she's been a bridge for so many people across uh, her career, across so many different projects. Um, and really, I just want to thank you for, want to thank you, Rita, for entrusting us with being the first public gallery to really showcase this work. Uh, we're really honored to have it. And I will, I will turn it back to George um, uh, for the rest of your introduction. Thank you. Well, uh, yes, three years, nine months ago, uh, Rita and I uh, unraveled the uh, uh, bush prints uh, in the gallery just outside there and agreed that uh, this would be a great exhibition to have here. Uh, during that time, of course, uh, Rita has uh, produced a remarkable book, uh, a, an extraordinary uh, documentary film uh, that, thank you to uh, Peter Mabies and uh, Cinema CNC, uh, will be uh, viewed uh, tomorrow, screened tomorrow. Uh, and, of course, this remarkable body of work. Um, and uh, I know you'd rather learn about it from Rita than from I. And uh, so, without further ado, it is my pleasure indeed to introduce you, Rita Leisler. Please welcome Rita. Partially turning the lights out. Can everyone hear me okay? Sorry. So happy to be in Prince George. Um, as I think has been clear from all the introductions, I've really come full circle. Uh, I first came to Prince George in, oh, uh, before I actually move this to the front, the uh, duct tape prints we've been talking about that I brought to see, uh, you know, a curator of a real uh, important curator at an important gallery were these duct tape prints that I had hung up in the bush, and they even had dead bugs on them. And we came and we laid them out on the floor, and George was like, this is fantastic. So thanks, George, for being really open to that. And that also explains the trailer in the other room and the duct tape prints that you see in the other room, which are the very same prints from the, the Bush Camp exhibition, which really was the world premiere of the Tree Planner exhibition. So uh, yeah, I came to Prince George when I was 20. Uh, here I am on my first uh, tree planning job ever, uh, not far from here, I think sort of toward Cornell. Um, and a couple of pictures of me tree planting. That's me in the front there. I planted for 10 years. So here I am kind of getting slightly older, but, uh, and then here I am my last year planting. I think I look a little tireder, but you know, I'm still pretty young. And uh, I, like many tree planters, um, it was a really big part of my life. I mean, I was going through university at the same time. I actually have a master's degree in French and English literary theory. 
Um, oh, I'm going to come, come, this is going to be meaningful later. So, <laughs> tree planting, <laughs> a lot of women plant trees, and it's unusual in a heavy physical labor job that women are so good at it. And the real main reason is that you don't need a lot of upper body strength, you need strength and you need um, endurance, but lower body strength is much more important and women are just as good as men are at it. And so that's why, I mean, tree planting is really unusual in bushwork, in physical industrial labor, in that it now, nowadays is 50% women, although my, my first camp was me and 12 guys, but, um, uh, you know, years later, I, I spent three months in the desert living with 150 cavalry soldiers and just me. So that was probably pretty good training for being in communities of guys. But uh, I was also an alpine ski racer when I was younger. And so to talk about the strong legs, uh, skiers have really strong legs. And that's one reason a lot of skiers do it. Also, when you ski, it's like you and the ground under your feet. And tree planting is like that too. You have to be quick on your feet, it's really important. And if you look at this picture, sorry, I'm a little thirst, thirsty. Um, and you look at the athletic stance. Uh, this is Spider Savage, who was one of my ski racing heroes in the 70s. And if you look at this athletic stance, it's going to resonate in my photographs of tree planters. This is Jean-Claude Cully. Again, you see the, uh, the athletic stance and the way that in my, in my visual sense, the ski poles are kind of like the shovels flying up in the airs of the hands of the tree planters. So uh, uh, in 1996, um, I actually, I, I published an article with a bunch of friends of mine who first collected photographs by and about tree planters for an article that was published in Canadian Geographic. And uh, it actually won a gold medal at the National Magazine Awards, which uh, was my first of, of uh, many, actually. Uh, but uh, the hands here are also really important in the work that I've since done. I spent many, many decades thinking about the hands of tree planters. Um, I should also uh, note that I didn't take any of the photographs for this because I wasn't, a, I wasn't a professional photographer. I was interested in photography, but being a professional photographer is hard and I didn't have those skills. So we were curating this work together, but my contribution was in curating and in writing. I wrote the introduction and I wrote a poem actually for it. Um, that I, but I won't read because we're we don't have. I'm I'm, I, I'm going to try and fit my slideshow to the time we we have, so which is fine. Um, but I just wanted to say that I've had an interest in the artwork behind tree planting for a really 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 long time, long before I became a photographer myself. Um, so some of the photographs in that in that article were by a photographer named Lorraine Gilbert. Because this work that I made does not come out of a vacuum, right? There's a legacy of art and art history, of course, behind me, and also a photograph of tree planters. So this, these are some of Lorraine Gilbert's uh, very well-known photographs of tree planters, uh, which are also in the collection of the National Gallery of Canada. And they are all, they're posed, they're shot with a medium format camera like my project is. Some of them are shot with a muslin background behind them, as you can see. They're, they're wonderful, incredible photo photographs that influenced me to want to become a photographer because I first started looking at these when I was tree planting in the 80s. Um, but <laughs> I know, they're really, they're fantastic. And I think there are a bunch of people in this room who are of this era as well. So. Uh, we recognize the, the longer shovels, for instance, you know, um, the clothing's a bit different. So photography is a technical art, and the, what, the kinds of pictures that we can make are influenced by the kind of technology that exists, and also the trends in art at the time. So the photographs that I made in this project could not have been made if a certain 
camera had not been invented in 2015. So I start shooting in 2016, but the technology that made it possible to make these, not just the camera, but also the flash technology, had to be invented first. So Lorraine Gilbert could never have made these photographs, even had she thought of them, okay? Um, and Lorraine is working in a time when Richard Avedon is extremely popular and influential. You can see how Richard Avedon is posing subjects in a doc documentary context against flat backgrounds to accentuate them kind of as uh, still lifes in a way, right? And still is a very important, they're very still and, and motionless in the way they appear in the photographs. So these are, some of you might recognize these photographs are certainly this, this style of photographing people against, you know, not models, but people in the real world, laborers and workers in particular, which hasn't always been a subject of art. And in fact, photographing workers has fallen out of fashion. And that's one of the things with this project, I think is that people, you know, appreciate uh, the, photographing and the respect given to physical and manual labor. So uh, 22 years after I discover the work of Lorraine Gilbert, um, here, okay, this is just kind of funny. This is me at work, but this is kind of just funny. One of the tree planters, of many are artists, one of the tree planters made this incredible diorama of me uh, as a photographer out in the cut block. I have that at my house. Um, <laughs> here you can see my assistant Jade with her light. Basically, it's me and my assistant with a giant light on a softbox, and we're running around the cut block with the tree planters who are in motion. And so, uh, I'm going to show you this two-minute clip where you can see uh, you can see me at work, which I think helps that helps you understand the photographs that you're looking at. You're out in the block all by yourself and you don't see anybody all day. All you have are your trees and your land. And I always thought that everyone else was planting more than me and going faster than me. And that would push me and I would just be like, you're too slow, you're too slow, everybody's ahead of you. And I would just like work and work and work. And at the end of the day, I would feel like I had just fucking blown it and I was a complete loser. And then I would go home or get on the bus and find out that, you know, not only, like, maybe I'd even highballed the camp. And it's a strange kind of motivating thing, this sense that you're never, you're, you know, you're never doing good enough. So there's always a sense of urgency and you always have in your gut this kind of feeling that you have to work harder and better and you have to be more prepared for every moment. And it's one tree at a time you keep going regardless of feeling discouraged. You just can't let yourself think about that. It's just the next thing, plant the next tree. And at the end of the day, you've planted all your bags, you've, you've, uh, you've filled in some land, you've made some money, and you know you plant trees for 10 years and you've planted a forest. So, uh, you know, you can see the action involved in taking, in taking these photographs. And, uh, you know, at the end I say, you plant trees for, ten, you know, one day at a time, one bag up at a time, you plant trees one day, and at the end of 10 years you planted a forest. And this is a theme that runs through this project, and in the film it becomes much clearer that this very, you know, simple uh, sort of rule of living, also, you know, you make a film or you make a long form photographic project one tree at a time, and you live life one day at a time. And the cut block is a place where you can learn that. And perseverance is an underlining theme as well, you know. And uh, you know, any anyone who's successful or who's lived at a certain age will tell you that perseverance is is perhaps the most important uh, factor to success in anything you do. So here are some of the photographs. I won't spend a long time on them because they're hanging in the gallery. Um, but uh, I think you can see the physicality and the, the motion of them. Um, okay. So this, uh, this motion that I'm capturing in the photographs was 
you know, something that I knew technically and aesthetically would be capable, would be possible for me to do. There's a term in art history um, called temporal freezing. So a painter like Caravaggio was famous for this concept of temporal freezing, where the figures are frozen in, a, in an energetic moment. And that's what I wanted to do with the tree planters. And for that, they had to be in motion. It's, uh, people look at these photographs for the first time, and they think they're staged, my portraits. And they think that they're staged because of the effect of the lighting and the way that I'm mimicking art history and I'm creating these, these effects on them. If you look at them, if you don't look at them closely, in fact, the publisher of my book, uh, Dowie Lewis, Stephen, my gallerist, sent him these photographs uh, saying, you know, this, this, should, this might interest you. And eventually Dowie wrote back to him and said, you know, you know I'm not interested in staged photography. Like, why do you keep sending me these? And Stephen said, no, you don't get it. They're not staged. And Dowie just went, holy crap. And that's who published my book. But it is, it's the essentialness of this, this moment in action that shows the intensity, the intention of the athletes, of the tree planters at work. Um, yeah. <laughs> and also when I was in the cut block, like if, if you know, tree planters are paid per tree. So if I had to make them stop, I wouldn't have lasted very long. I mean, one of the main things I didn't ever want to do was slow down production. You know, and I promised Garth Hadley, who is the owner of Coast Range Contracting, where this whole project was shot, that of course I wouldn't interrupt his work. Like if anything, I wanted to help, not hinder. And if, when I first arrived, the tree planters were justifiably, um, you know, uh, tentative about having me there for many, many reasons. But one was, well, are you going to get in the way of our, our work? And who are you? And can we trust you? And when I, you know, traced into the cut block, which might be, you know, seven kilometer walk up a mountain to find them, the first question they always asked me was, did you ever plant trees? You know, yes, 10 years. And, oh, and I also worked in war zones. And then they're like, well, maybe we'll give you a try. And, uh, and then, and after I photographed the same person, of course, they go back to camp and they report back to everybody like, oh, she, we didn't have to stop at all. In fact, it motivated me to go faster. And, you know, she's like running backwards and she's not in our way. And I mean, I had to be a tree planner too to have done this work, not only because I don't think anyone who hadn't been a tree planner would do all the work necessary to tell this story, but also because I had to be able to anticipate where they're going uh, as they're moving because I have to figure out where's their next tree going to be and be in that spot before they are. So, uh, so I'm going to try and wrap up in about three minutes so there's a bit of time for Q&A. So there's another part of this project I call the Enchanted Forest. And these are photographs that I took on the margins of the cut block. So these are not like uh, the typical romantic old growth forests we're meant to be, that we see, sorry, that we see more photographs of in art books, but I'm trying to talk about these transitional places. And uh, they're transitional places in the landscape, and some of them are frightening, some of them are burnt forest areas, but they're also areas with kind of mythological layers of significance, and I, I call them the enchanted forest because I want to evoke fairy tales as, fairy tales in the way that they are places of transformation, and the cut lot and tree planting is a place of transformation as well, and not just in the work they're doing, but in where they're living in the land. And most tree planters go planting to make money, but they become witnesses to land and it changes them. And after they leave tree planting, they're not the same people, of course, they were when they started. And some become foresters or environmentalists or some end up running tree planting companies their entire lives, you know? Like, thank you to the contractors in the tree planting world who make all of this possible as well. Um, but you can see the clear aesthetic relationships, right? And that's something that I can do because I have a, you know, I have like a, I'm gonna skip that video, because I have a visual vocabulary that as I'm taking the pictures, 
I, you know, I know exactly what I'm going for. You know, it's not an accident that they, they look the way they do. Um, I hope that some of, oh, well, actually in the Enchanted Forest room, you'll be able to see some of the time-lapse videos that I made. And if you come to see the film, which is screening tomorrow, but it's also going to be screening occasionally through the next three months. And I'm also coming back on July 14th for a big closing party. So you'll have other opportunities to see the film where a lot of this story is played out and, uh, and described. These are also pictures that are in the exhibition. I mentioned earlier, note the hands. We really wanted to do a show that, again, was about the work and the labor. And so these are some of the hands layouts that I made for the book, but that are also, when the screen comes down, you'll see there's a big uh, uh, spread of hands right behind me. And there's the book cover, so I hope you'll have a look at the book. If you like, it's for sale. And uh, I'm going to skip this. This is part of me designing my film. So. Uh, well, I just feel like saying so. You know, it was my it was it was my first feature film, and uh, I designed it on a map of Costa Rica. But I created a logging road, and because even in my own head, I wanted to realize that this is an allegorical journey. It's it's not a film with like a plot traditional plot structure. It's a journey whereby uh, trees get trees go in the ground and a film gets made, and at the end of the film, uh, 45 million trees have been planted, and a film has been made, and along the way, we have encounters, and we meet uh, people who are inspiring and tell us their stories. I'm not gonna show the trailer, but that's okay, because some of you will see the film. That's the poster for the film that you can see, and this, I actually just got an email saying that I can announce for the first time that uh, Forest for the Trees is in the official competition of the Guadalajara Film Festival in the socio-environmental section. And it's incredibly prestigious. This is the biggest festival in Latin America. And I just think it's incredible that the film, part, partly because of the medium of the film, it, it can travel in this way and that it's gonna be seen by people all around the world and it's up with films from France and Belgium and Denmark and Brazil and the United States and our, you know, our world of tree planting that for me started here in Prince George is, you know, making a journey across the world. So uh, I will open it up to a couple of questions. I think we have like five minutes. Yep. Microphone here uh, for somebody who wishes to ask a question into a microphone. Can I give this to you? Thank you. tree planting now, the change is going to more diversity of um, trees? Uh, there, of is, there is more diversity of the trees being planted, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's evolving. Like, um, afterwards, if you want to mingle, you could probably ask Dave Wilson about that. He's the owner of Celtic Reforestation. But, uh, so, so to, uh, you could talk to Dave. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I could, I could have a long answer to that, but you know, like the trees that are being planted are those that are indigenous to the area anyways, right? I mean, they're planting spruce and pine and fir, but tree planters will carry a number of species in their bags, and then when they get checked, you know, you have to certain plant, certain trees won't grow in, in uh, dry soil, and certain won't grow in wet soil, so yeah, usually three anyways species. Um, sorry, can I just ask you to speak into the microphone? Thank oh. you. So we are. Uh, oh, so her question was. Uh, Thank you. I mean, so was it like that when you started, though? Like, was it was it more of a one for commercial? Well, they are, these are still for commercial, right? But mm -hmm. so it's in the interest of the forestry industry to, I think, plant the trees that are going to grow the best. Um, so. It has changed a lot. I can't like. I think a lot of the species were the same because they are like the original species that grow here, that grow in those areas. Like you're not going to plant, you know, Japanese, no. you know, maples in uh, northern BC. There's a question over here. There were, the question, like, there were lots of other differences. The trees had giant roots on them. They were much bigger. And... Yeah. But there's a lot of science to go to it for sure. So, but. 
Yeah, uh, the, the question I have is, um, uh, Sarah at the beginning, she asked us to plot the tree planting. I've planted trees on and off for 23 years. I still do it, like, if, if the opportunity comes up. But um, I guess my, my concern with the show is that it's not, it doesn't really feel like I'm here or doing what I do because, you know, it's just a job to get paid for. It's like any other resource that's jacking up. So one of the questions is, like, why do we, why are we glorifying tree planting? And the other thing is, you know, I've, I've looked at the place I planted, actually. The very first place I planted was on Baldy Hughes in 1998. And uh, actually, the surgeon, I went in there and did a bird survey, and it was a total dead zone. It's like, it's all pine trees. And the stumps are Douglas spur. So it's actually, we converted the forest from Douglas spur, pine, spruce, into almost 100% pine. So when you say, like, things have changed, like, as far as I know, we're still planting pine and spruce, and we do Douglas spur for show. Douglas fir die in a couple weeks. They don't really survive too well. Uh, they like shade. I know because they, I plant all the time. Douglas fir and they die. Um, and I think we only do like 15% anyway. And also subalpine fir, we log a ton of subalpine fir. We plant zero subalpine fir. Um, and of course, they don't plant aspen, they don't plant birch, they don't plant cotton. To the contrary, we spray these things with helicopters. We're actually in the most heavily sprayed forest in maybe Canada, around Prince George, you can spray everything. Like, you go to the Blackwater Road, block after block, and you can spray it to wipe out the deciduous diversity. And you see these photos, there's tons of deciduous trees in all these photos, but that's not where we're growing, right? So, I mean, I guess my question is why, why are we working on this? Because it's really, we're not really replacing what we took. We're not, you know, you plant enough years to plant a forest, but we don't plant even a tree farm. Uh, okay, well, uh, that's a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll answer it in two parts. So the first, uh, well, I mean, I've talked to a lot of foresters. I had a forestry consultant on the film, and uh, yeah, for sure, these are, these are farmed trees, but I've been to areas that I planted, and even if you're replanting them to be cut down later, Dave, you know, Dave, I see you. So, do you want to help answer this, or, or am I, if I'm if I'm not doing okay, you, you can help me. But um, you know, 80 years, it still becomes an ecosystem. Like, have you visited uh, areas that you like? I visited areas that I planted 40 years ago, and they are like have dense, heavily grown forests. I mean, maybe they're going to be cut down, but these are not trees that are. They're not like old redwoods that are going to live 300 years. They're species that only live like 80 years or so, and they're going to fall down. They're not, we're not like killing, you know, 300-year old growth trees. And a lot of tree planters who, you know, I think very vocally object to cutting down old growth forests will say, you know, take my trees. Like, we are farming them. We're planting them. It's part of sustainability in, you know, a resource industry for sure, right? I mean, some trees are being planted with the intention of, you know, maybe not being cut down, but these are not trees that if you didn't cut them down, they would live for 300 years. Do you want to add something, Dave? Well, all I want to say is, uh, the forestry is not a, a perfect science, and uh, it's changed a lot over the years, and um, of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's an industrial forest that we, we live in and, you know, provides jobs for people and um, hospitals and schools and we fund all that. But <clears throat> over the last number of years, a lot of changes have taken place in the forest. There is a lot more diversity in the way that we plant today. Um, there's a lot more um, emphasis on the specifics of where the trees go, the microscopes they would go. And there's a lot more uh, variety of species in, in the way we plant. But I think what Rita is really celebrating here is more than anything else is the human accomplishment. So yeah, so I can take from that because there is of course this, the science side of it. And I, you know, I made a choice not to make, certainly in my film, a film that was about the science, but about the work behind it. And, you know, headlines across the world say that planting billions of trees is an important way of combating climate change. You know, however, there may be different ways that those trees could be planted. 
but if we're going to plant billions of trees, uh, maybe they will be planted differently. Maybe, you know, other people will come up with ways of planting them for different reasons or better or whatever, but th those billions of trees are not going to be planted by volunteers, right? Putting, I mean, you know what it's like to do physical labor, uh, hard physical labor. It's not, I mean, people have said, oh, how cute tree planting, like, are they doing it as volunteers? And it's like, no, it's brut brutal physical labor. Like, so whether these individuals, whether tree planters are planting for forestry companies or they're planting for uh, some environmental organization, it's still the same labor. And I mean, that's sort of what I'm choosing to look at is that human element behind it. Um, and, uh, you know, also the way that I came at this story from the perspective of a war photographer, I would spent, you know, 20 years of my life photographing conflict zones and a lot of that of soldiers. And I have done, I did a particular series of portraits of soldiers where they look young and vulnerable. And I was criticized for, you know, why are you making soldiers look young and vulnerable, like you're, you know, you're undermining them or you're insulting them. And I'm like, well, I'm 40 years old and they're 18 and they are young, vulnerable human beings. And, uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, and to go, like, I, I really appreciate your question, but another, another side to, you know, tree planters have always sort of been stuck between the, the environmentalists who see them as being cogs in the wheel of the logging industry and certainly when I started, the logging communities that saw tree planters as interlopers and, you know, hippies from the south. So the tree planters were kind of stuck in between. And at the onset of tree planting, which, you know, by the way, is only in its third generation, like I'm, I was part of the end of the first generation. Dave is a bit older than me. He would have been part of the first generation. Whereas logging has been around since the first British and French ships came to North America in the mid 1600s. I mean, that's why they came because they cut down all their trees and suddenly they didn't have trees for the mass for their warships. So that's the foundation of, lo of logging. And you know, tree planting only really comes into existence maybe in the 19 early 1900s, they start learning the science be between, behind making seedlings because before you can plant trees, you need seedlings. So the science was evolving, but it's not until the early 70s with the real increase of te technology and logging where suddenly they're cutting you know, way, way, way more trees that it becomes urgent to find a way to replace these trees faster. I mean, this is information I get from my forestry consultant. So, um, so there are these changes in tides. There's also, uh, you know, the important influence of indigenous knowledge that is coinciding with the rise in the environmental movement. So tree planting is in a transitional phase, I think, and part of what I'm trying to do is to raise awareness of what tree planting is so it becomes bigger in the, you know, the national consciousness and the worldwide consciousness, like the practical side between planting trees, which really is like dirty hands and hard bodies and the strong minds that you need to do hard physical labor while still believing in yourself and what you're doing, like with anything in life, right? It's also a metaphor for everything in life. So I don't know if that helps answer your question. It's certainly something I think about a lot, so I'm glad you brought it up. distinctive things about being able to shoot these fast, fast moving subjects with flash, okay? So they are moving so fast that I have to shoot at 1 500th of a second, if, if you're a photographer. So 1 500th of a second, first of all, with synchronized flash. So there has to be a camera that can operate synchronizing flash at 1 500th of a second. And that can, and also on top of that, that, uh, can operate at a, a really high ISO because as you can see it's what you call high key lighting where everything is bright and illuminated and the depth of field is ultra deep and that's what also gives it that painterly character because it can't like 
Uh, slim depth of field is something that only cameras created. You know, when you see paintings where there's no good depth of field, that's a painting that's been influenced by the, inf the, in the uh, invention of photography. So I'm trying to go in the opposite direction. So to have that depth of field really deep, I need to be able to shoot at like F18, F22. So even on a bright Sunday, uh, to shoot at F18 and have it full bright, uh, I need to be at ISO 800, which is extraordinarily high. But this camera, it's the fa it's a phase one camera, um, and now there are, there are a couple, some of the Hassel Glass will do this as well. They will shoot super high quality at this kind of detail with those uh, functions. And then the strobe lighting is, uh, it's a pro photo strobe. It shoots a 500 watt second burst, which is incredibly, incredibly bright. And again, all these things have to come together uh, to make it work. And that not, would not have been possible uh, even in 2012. Right, right. So are these um, medium format or large format? They're medium. Okay. Yeah, so it's a 100 megapixel camera. The files are 12,000 pixels by 10,000 pixels. Holy, all right. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Every day anyone fall asleep doing that? He doesn't follow tech, but thanks for asking. I'm always glad to have at least one other or a few tech heads in the audience. Hi, Lena. Thank you very much for this talk. It's really interesting. Earlier in your talk, you said that you felt that photographing workers has fallen out of favor or style. Would you mind saying a few words for words? Well, I, I mean, you know, that's not like a formal study, but as someone who looks at a lot of uh, photography and art, like there are, you know, traditions of, of, uh, of labor photography, like one of the first we think of is like Soviet realism, for instance, where it's connected to political movements or it's, it's rope, you know, but um, um, just in photography, it's just not a really major topic. and. I mean, I was at a show in, in uh, Paris a couple of years ago with this work, and uh, it was under a, it was in a competition, and one of the jurors who was, you know, an older French guy, who uh, he just he just said, it's 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 repugnant to see women portrayed looking so ugly, and uh, you know, and what he's he's like, well, women women in particular should not be portrayed working, like there's something dirty about it, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 I can't really talk to that a lot, but um, it was something that was really important to me. And I even just know in my life, like, there hasn't, I, you know, struggled to get respect for the physical labor that I had done in my life. And I mean, uh, one of the reasons I did this project was when I was working in war zones, people would ask me, uh, what prepared me for that war. And I mean, I'm certainly not comparing tree planting to war, you know, people are not being killed. But um, the, the hard labor, the not bathing for weeks on end, uh, the mental endurance that I needed. Uh, but when I said that, people's response was surprise because tree planting to them didn't sound all that hard. And in fact, at one point, my agent in New York said, well, you should take this tree planting, whatever it is, like off your CV because it looks trivial compared to your other accomplishments. And, uh, and I thought, well, they don't know what it is. And so, so, so I thought, you know, one day I will go back to this world and I will try and show people what, what this work is as like an individual, what you learn as an individual doing it. So, um, and what was that? yeah, so tree, so, just to add to something from before, that tree planting was seen as the lowest job in the forest. So in the logging industry, before we had you know, the tree planting that, that we know now, this really unique tree planting where contractors, uh, outside contractors do the work. And in the United States, by the way, it's not like this because the land is owned by the companies themselves and it's done on the inside. But tree planting was considered the lowest job in the forest. And I think a lot of people know, like indigenous people did it, women did it, uh, prisoners did it, and the loggers were just like, you know, because logging for a long time was connected with nation building and these heroic concepts. So that's also part of the heroicism is a response to the historic representation of logging and me trying to like bring these two histories together in, a, in an aesthetic art context. And, you know, uh, when Sarah was saying, I, I didn't really talk about 
you know, uh, uh, creating bridges, right? But, but artists, and artists create bridges. That's part of what, of what I think my job is. So I am trying to create all these bridges without actually being a scientist or an expert in these particular fields, you know? And then another interesting thing about, about the, you know, who's taking care of our forest is it's not just foresters, it's, it's, it's artists and philosophers, and what a strange thing that is, you know? I think we have time for one final question. And also, you know, I'll be wandering around after. Great. Great. Um, that's great. Thank you for this presentation to make. Um, where in the province and over what period of time did you collect your photos? Did, did I make the photos? Yeah, did you make the photos? Okay, so they're all in uh, British Columbia, as far south as Kamloops, as far north as Fort St. John. We covered, uh, what, uh, like, inside an area of about 500,000 square kilometers. Somewhere I have the statistics. I think it's at the front of the... I drove 50,000 kilometers. Um, I took 8,000 photographs. Uh, I did it over, I guess, about three months each year, starting in 2016. I, I think at the beginning, I thought maybe it would take me two years. I have footage of my, video footage of myself. I'm in the film too, a little bit, because I, I create a bridge between the planters and the audience, but I also wanted to show the labor and my own experience. And so I, this is in the film, but I have an interview with myself in my tent on like day three, and it's minus three degrees, and I'm in my tent, and I already have pink eye and a sore throat, and I'm talking to my camera, and I'm like, what have I done? Like, why, what am I doing back here? Like, I swore I would never, like, tree planters famously quit every year. And I said, if I hadn't told so many people that I was doing this, I would have quit right then and there. And I said, but I've already invested $20,000, and I, I mean, $20,000 by the end of it, I, it's cost me nearly half a million. But uh, I had no idea how long it was gonna take. But it's a hard subject, and uh, you have to travel a lot. I had to, like, you know, tr climb, sometimes uh, hike five kilometers into the bush and then climb a mountain before even finding a planter. Like, you don't even know where they are, you know? And then you find one and then it starts to rain and you've lost your whole day, you know? Um, and at the end of the third year, um, I was done. And they had a little party for me and they had it made me a cake. And on the way driving out of camp, just before I drive out of camp, one of the tree planters comes up to me and says, you know, I never told you the end of that story. And it was really loud and I wasn't interviewing him. And he started telling me this story. And I get in the truck and I start, and I'm leaving camp and my assistant's next to me and I go, shit, we have to go back next year. And so I went back the next year and none of my friends and family could believe I was going back again. But it's a real tree planting thing to quit and then to go back. And, uh, but you know, as an artist too, I knew when I didn't have enough, and I, it's a good thing I went back that last year. I put in, I think, nearly four months that last year, and uh, uh, it was important. So then when, when I thought I was kind of done, I was kind of done, although right now some people know that I'm coming back in July to have a closing party, because I can't, you know, this beautiful three-month exhibit. I've never had an ex exhibition this long, by the way. No one's ever built me an Atco trailer either. So I'm coming. <laughs> So I'm coming back, but I'm also going to be, uh, ma I'm going to rent a truck in Kamloops, and I'm going to make my way north, and I'm going to make day trips into camps, and I'm going to photograph more hands, because I want to do a grid of like 50 hands. So I said I was done, but I guess I'm not quite. <laughs> Lisa, thank you so much. Um, Risa, it's a beautiful show. Thank you for all your work. I, I also do want to echo uh, Sarah's thanks to uh, Don and to Karen, uh, to Kate, to Teresa, uh, to Roxanne, to Chaos. Uh, gosh, you know a lot of people worked on this exhibition. A lot of people played a part. Thank you all to them. And I should thank my I should thank my father and my sister who paid for most of this project. <laughs> <laughs>